Hey everyone, Mario again, coming at you with another review. Today I bring you a review of the final entry in the original Planet of the Apes series, Battle for the Planet of the Apes. Now, this is the shortest entry at 86 minutes, or at least in the original series, because most of the other ones are at least about an hour and a half to almost two hours long. This one is not even an hour and a half, just a little bit less. I think that, like the last couple entries in the series, the budget slowly got smaller. Now, from what I've read officially, this had a slightly higher budget than Conquest. It comes off not as good as Conquest, and that's because it has the same problem that Beneath the Planet of the Apes did. They slashed the budget and they were trying to recreate the world of the original film. Though, this is the world that would become the world of the original film. So it's not there yet, but still, you could tell that the budget just didn't allow them to fully realize the vision. I mean, on the VHS, director J. Lee Thompson, who also directed Conquest, ma imagine how difficult it was to do that, because he had to bring the camera in closer for the action sequences, and even though he did a good job trying to mask the fact that it wasn't as epic as it could be, I mean, even the riot scene at the end of the previous film is more epic than the battle scenes here, you could still tell that the budget hurt it, but he did a good job trying to mask it, and at least try to get something good out of what he could get it with. Now, the film has a 5 and I'm to be a 32 with the audience on Rotten Tomatoes and a 38 with the critics. There's no consensus, but it seems that this is usually considered the worst of the sequels and the worst film in the original series and probably the whole series in general. I would say it's hard for me to say in the original series if I like this or Beneath the worst because they have some of the same problems money-wise, even though this had a lower budget. It's just, I think I'm drawn a little bit more to the story in this one, because some of the characters more interest me. Granted, beneath, we still have Cornelius and Zira, and Heston is still in there. It's just that, uh, just doesn't come off as, doesn't draw me in as much. Maybe, maybe some of the plot points do, it's just, this one, the story in and of itself interests me more, you know. We got Caesar there, and then of course the beginning Ape Society, which... The one real, I know where a lot of these films you gotta check your brain a little bit at the door involving the talking apes. Less so the original films because of how many years have passed, but only 10 to 20 years have passed in the timeline of this film and yet all the other apes can talk. I mean, unless you did something like they do in the second reboot where you genetically modify the apes and then of course it'd be more logical that they can learn to do it. It's like, what? How is he doing that? I know apes are smart, but they maybe sign language, but it's like, well, like I said, it's one of those things you have to check your brain at the door a little bit, and you can go with it. Now, with that, one of the things I like is that the chimpan is that the chimpanzees are the same as we normally see them. The gorillas are the same, which I guess is supposed to show that not humans aren't the only violent ones, and that this is probably at least maybe in the original timeline, or if this if you view this as the beginning of the Planet of the Apes proper, this is where the whole gorilla thing starts. But it shows that the orangutans did not start off as pompous, holier-than-thou people, that they actually started out as intellectuals, similar to the chimps, but obviously expressing their intellect different. And this is uh, shown in two specific uh, characters, one of which being the main orangutan, Virgil, I believe his name is. Um, see, I'm double-checking, yeah, Virgil. Which, he's a very interesting character played by uh, Paul Williams. Now, uh, the score in the film is done by Leonard Rosenman, or Rosenman, how you pronounce it. Which he also did the score for, I think, a couple Star Trek films and also Robocop 2, which, after watching this film and hearing the score, I now get what uh, Michael King meant when he reviewed Robocop 2 about Leonard uh, reusing some of his old score. Because some of the score here reminded me of some of the score from Robocop 2. At least it's not style-wise, actually, like, melody-wise, only there was another underscore to make the theme different. It's like, okay, that's a little lazy, but I think the way he did in Robocop 2 came out a little bit better musically, but that's just me. me. Of course, it's kind of funny, kind of make, for that it makes me f laugh a little bit, considering a little music connection here that uh, Jerry Goldsmith, some people maybe tongue-in-cheek wise criticized him for the score for Alien because some of his tracks were replaced with his older tracks and they're like, ah, oh, way to repeat yourself, Jerry. That's from the DVD case I'm wondering. 
Now, another thing I like about one thing else to say I like about this film is we finally get to see the lawgiver in the flesh. We never have seen him in the series. We've seen statues and people talk about him, but the beginning and the end, the bookends of the film, we get to see the lawgiver in the flesh. And as we find out at the end, he's telling a story to a group of apes and humans. And in the film, he's played by John Huston, which he's known as a director. He directed films like The Treasure of the Sierra Madre and The African Queen, which is a classic film. And uh, other films, I think, he'd like, I think he directed The Red Badge of Courage. I could be wrong. He's also known here and there for an actor, but for people like me, he, acting-wise, he's mostly known as voicing Gandalf in the Rankin-Bass, uh, Hobbit, and... Return of the King films, at which I forgot this is who that was, and then when I was watching the film, I heard the voice, I'm like, why does that sound familiar? Hey, it's Gandalf! Of course, he did this movie before that, but he just has one of those very distinct voices. I'm just surprised he didn't do more voice work. He just has one of those voices. I'm surprised he didn't do more acting work, either, because he did more directing than he did acting, but like, he, like one interesting fact is apparently he directed both his father and his daughter to Oscar-winning performances, so that's a little uh, thing there. Now, uh, after the book ends, the plot of the film is that it's, according to Wikipedia, 12 years later. It doesn't really give a distinct year, but you know at least it's a decade. Uh, Caesar, after the revolution that he started at the end of Conquest, it's now a post-apocalyptic society. He is tr leading this little town, and he's trying to broker peace between the apes that live there and the humans. Now, the humans are treated as second-class citizens, but it's not as bad as how the apes were treated in the previous film or how we saw the humans treated in the first film. It's a little bit in between. The humans are allowed a little bit of freedom, but they still are second-class. Like, one thing they can't say is they cannot say no to an ape at all. And, of course, we that is nailed home a little bit when our, one of our human characters, who is a teacher, tells Aldo, who is basically our ape antagonist, who is a gorilla played by... Claude Atkins. No, in the school he gets a little hissy fit and is about to do something to him when Caesar intervenes. Now by this time, uh, Caesar, you can tell he has a lot of his mind because he's trying to make the society as best he can. He's married to Lisa, the female ape from the previous film, and they have a son named Cornelius, obviously named after Caesar's father. Now, uh, Caesar has a human assistant, McDonald, who is not the same McDonald from the previous film. He is the brother of that character. Now, the reason they did this is because the actor who played McDonald in the previous film could reprise his role for some reason or another. I've heard either he wasn't interested or he had a previous uh, engagement, which the whole thing with McDonald in the first sequel is kind of funny. But either way, instead of killing him, they killed him off, but they also brought in his brother. And story reason, it would make sense why Caesar would have another McDonald as his uh, assistant. I mean, kind of a little, you know, paying of a debt to the brother. Especially since it's 12 years later, who knows what happened between now and then. Maybe McDonald, the other McDonald, helps Caesar along the way. Maybe saved Caesar's life a couple times, so it's a debt. And also maybe he likes the brother a little bit, too. So, uh, he tells him that he knows that there might be footage of his parents, and this could actually help him decide what to do about the future. So, the two of them, along with Virgil the Orangutan, go to the Forbidden City. And there they not only find what they seek, but they find that there are mutated humans there led by Governor Culp, who originally, from what I understand, this was going to be uh, back from the previous film, but they, I guess that actor was busy. Well, so got his decision, which uh, Severn Darden was in the previous film, which I do like that they keep continuity there, give it to one of uh, the previous governor's subordinates. And, of course, he has that hatred of Caesar from before the fall, so... That actually does play into it at that point and later in the film. This eventually leads to fighting between the humans and the apes. And of course, Caesar has to deal with the inner ape fighting as well. And this leads to the ending, which it makes it look like uh, peace is going to happen between the humans and the apes. And it goes back to the lawgiver thing. And the thing I mentioned in the previous review, the whole thing with the tear, they said that was supposed to symbolize, the, symbolize that Caesar is... Uh, vision ultimately failed, but as I mentioned, I don't see it that way. Some people could see that the whole thing's a cycle of going in a circle, but I view it a little bit like how Virgil does when Virgil mentions time travel, that it's like a road getting into lanes, and they probably could have averted it, but at the same time, I do 
admit that may, while trying to change the future by getting into a different lane, they probably could have caused it. It's open to interpretation, but I view it in the more optimistic way that they probably did change the future. Maybe for the best, maybe for the worst, but it's up to the viewer to decide. Now, one interesting thing is this was the second to last film produced by Arthur P. Jacobs because he died in 1973, two weeks after this film was released. And uh, Den uh, did, did the screenplay of what, as well, and he actually came up with a title. But I guess the studio wasn't fully happy with what he had done, so they brought in two other screenwriters, John William Corrington and Joyce Hooper Corrington, a husband-wife duo, who had just uh, worked on the Omega Man. Uh, ironically, Heston was the star in that one, so a little funny bit of connection there. And they revamped the script. Uh, Den was still given story credit, despite an appeal to the Writers Guild of America for shared credit on the screenplay. And it says, in, according to Wikipedia, Den claimed to have rewritten 90% of the dialogue and he altered the ending. I guess this was him doing another rewrite of their script, but yeah, the the script by the Corrigans ended, ended with on a playground with ape and human children fighting. And Dan chose to go up with a close up of the statue, which of course one of the Corrigans said that was stupid. But I have to say that's a little bit more subtle. I mean, you still get a little bit of the apes pushing, but I think it's a little bit more subtle for the uh, tier. And look, while I'm on there, I have a visitor. And for those of you who haven't seen the little home videos, this is Sky the Little Kitty Cat, newest member of our family. And yeah, she's a very curious little kitty. Very curious kitty. Now, of course, she didn't watch the film with me. You remember? The disease that kills cats. Shh, don't tell her. Don't tell her. Yeah, she's, she's being a very attention-seeking little kitty right now. But anyway, back on to the video. I don't remember specifically everything it, it mentioned about uh, Den and his uh, original screenplay. I think it was going to be a little bit more elaborate, so they probably had it changed for budget reasons, but I think it also was a little bit... I don't know if it was a little bit more violent like the original cut of Conquest was, but I think there was stuff in there... Obviously there was stuff in there the studio didn't want, but I don't remember specifically what it was. Maybe before I edit this I'll probably go back watch the beginning of the VHS tape and probably type it in either in the description box or at this point in the video to let you guys know what it is. But it, do it doesn't hurt the film a lot. You shouldn't get my coffee, but... It, uh... does make the film seem like it has the same problems as Beneath, but like I said, overall I'd probably watch this film before Beneath. But after this film, you can see kind of why this was the last Planet of the Apes film made until Burton's film. Uh, Thompson does a good job directing with the resources he has. The story does draw one in. I do like that it does show the problems Caesar would eventually face after trying to found a society of apes and humans. Of course, it makes me wonder what happened in the 600 years between the bookend and then. But, you know, open to imagination. From the looks of things, they probably didn't have to they either dealt with the mutants or didn't have to deal with them anymore. And had to deal with usual problems, petty politics, among other stuff. McDowell does a good job acting. His weakest performance of the four he did, but still pretty good. Claude Atkins, I think, does a good, okay job as McDonald. Uh, Natalie uh, Trundy as Lisa the chimpanzee, she does okay. Uh, Severn Darden does a good job. He's a, he has a little bit more screen time here than he did in the previous film, at least, where you know he's actually doing stuff. And uh, I think he was a good antagonist, though it would have been more interesting to see Beck return, but what can you do? You gotta do what you can with what you got. Hey, hey get away from those cords. Uh, let's see. Uh, rest of the cast, like John Huston as the lawgiver, did a good job. Um, Paul Williams as Virgil, he does a good job. I, he's probably my uh, favorite new character in the film, I mean, of the protagonist. And Claude Atkins does a great job as all, though you hate him. He's probably the second most despicable gorilla in the whole series, second only to uh, the general from beneath. The only good human is a dead human. You see where that philosophy begins here, because Aldo despises humans. Though on a side note, I wonder, is this supposed to be the same Aldo spoken of in, the, in Escape as the one that, according to the scrolls, uh, stood up against humans? 
thing to consider. Now, I give this film the same rating I give Beneath, a 3.5 out of 5, but it definitely has my attention a little bit more, so I'd say I'd put it above it. Now, how I rank the original series? It goes the original Planet of the Apes, Escape from the Planet of the Apes, Conquest of the Planet of the Apes, Battle for the Planet of the Apes, and Beneath the Planet of the Apes. Now, probably at the end of this review series, I'll rank the, all the films in the series. That'll probably be a little harder, but like I said, three and a half out of five, and I only recommend watching this if you want to watch all the films.